Hello and welcome all. My name is Isabel Rosenthal. I'm from the Public Programs Department um, at the Skirball. And we're so happy to once again be welcoming visitors to campus. So thank you so much for being here tonight. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Skirball, our cultural center was founded in part to celebrate American democratic ideals. And we welcome and encourage conversation aimed at examining our democracy. We know that to live in a safe and equitable society, we all must work together to understand where our fragilities lie. We are thrilled tonight to co-present this program with our esteemed literary partner, Andrea Grossman of Writer's Block. Writer's Block has been enriching our intellectual lives for over 25 years now by amplifying important contemporary authors, books, and thought leaders, and enhancing our general public's awareness and access to significant literary and cultural work. Andrea, thank you for all that you do for the Skirball and for our community at large. Please know that we are, have a book signing after, um, following our, the conclusion of our program. And there are also pre-signed books ready to go. So please stop by, and on your way out, please do grab our program's guide, um, which lists our many different offerings, um, both on campus and virtually, because we do hope to see you back here again. And without any, without any further ado, um, I'll pass the mic to Andrea, and I hope you all enjoy our conversation tonight. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Please turn your cell phones off. God, it's been so long since I've got I had to say that. It's so nice. Um, thank you all for braving traffic and the very contagious Dodger fever to be here tonight for such a great program. Thanks very much to the wonderful people here at the Skirball for making this event possible. It's a short notice and outside in this magnificent courtyard at that. Of course, huge thanks to Bob Costa and Kevin Merida. More about them in a moment. Runners Block and the Skirball team up for great events on a regular basis, virtually and in person. On Sunday at noon, Writers Block and the Skirball co-host a virtual program with acclaimed Israeli author David Grossman. And on November 3rd, Writers Block and the Skirball will co-host another virtual event with revered artist Ai Weiwei, whose works reflect a commitment to global social justice. If you caught his recent installation here at the Skirball, it's my guess that you'll want to join us. Now for tonight, we can barely open a newspaper, any newspaper, without seeing a reference to Bob Woodward's and Bob Costa's book, Peril, which is still causing reverberations in Washington and the international press for its manifold revelations. The news just keeps coming, and I mean, today, every day, it just keeps coming, about the January 6th insurrection, about Trump's and his Confederates' plans to delegitimize the election, and about the transition to the Biden presidency. Peril has been cited continuously, whether in the January 6th Congressional Committee subpoenas, in General Milley's hearings in front of Congress, and in international media regarding Trump lawyer John Eastman for his memo detailing just how the president's men could stage a coup. Peril has been cited repeatedly for the Bob's detail of how many in Trump's inner circle, his closest advisors, worried that he was clearly unfit for office. This is material we need to know, and we need to know it now, especially as 2024 is five minutes away. Bob Costa is a national political reporter for the Washington Post, and we see him frequently on NBC and MSNBC News. This is an intensely fast-moving book. You can't put it down. It's sort of a thriller uh, in the best and worst possible ways. I urge you to read it. Book Soup is here tonight with copies of Peril. Bob has signed a whole slew of them already, but he will personalize them, as Isabel said. Um, and I, I really urge you to get some for you and anybody who's interested in what's happening in America. Kevin
Kevin Merida, our executive editor of the LA Times, knows what a great reporter Bob Costa is. Kevin was his managing editor at the Washington Post, where he worked for over 20 years before Kevin headed to ESPN, where he ran the news and so much else. I'm so grateful that Kevin is now at the, at the helm of the LA Times. With his experience and vision, our LA Times will continue to engage with us in a better and more expanded way. I'm so delighted. And I'm, please welcome Bob Costa and Kevin Meredith. insurrection was a domestic political crisis. And there was kind of a conventional wisdom that it calcified around the day itself. You've seen reports about President Trump idly watching television. And he's in his dining room off the Oval Office watching TV as the insurrection happens at the Capitol. But as Woodward and I spent nine, ten months doing this, we were stunned and horrified at times as reporters to realize that January 6th wasn't the story. I just remember so many times Woodward and I would do interviews together separately, and we would look at each other and go, I said, would say, Bob, is this, is this like Watergate? Because you could see a conspiratorial effort afoot that President Trump was not idle. He was the opposite of passive. He was aggressive behind the scenes. And the story of January 6th in so many ways is about the days prior and the pressure points on Vice President Pence, on senators like Mike Lee of Utah, uh, on, all, on the Department of Justice. This was a, a campaign that was coordinated, directed from the top by the president, in coordination also with Rudy Giuliani and Steve Bannon on the outside. And it was with the explicit purpose to throw the election to the House of Representatives, delegitimize Biden's election, and have President Trump win a second term in the House of Representatives. And they came this close. This close. Why didn't they succeed? They, they, they almost succeeded. 
Well, here's the, the, the reason they actually didn't succeed is the John Eastman memo. If you have, haven't read the book, we discovered a two-page, six-point plan by a conservative lawyer from California named John Eastman that said to Pence, look, acknowledge that there are alternate slates of electors in the states. Throw them out, the current electors. Acknowledge alternate slates of electors, and that will bring Biden below 270. And inside the Trump White House, this memo was circulating. It was given, we found out, to Senator Mike Lee of Utah on January 2nd. It was given to the Vice President's office at the same time. And President Trump was telling everyone, with Eastman there with him, just say we need to delay it and we need to recognize alternate slates of electors. But ultimately, Pence, others on Capitol Hill say there is no such thing as alternate slates of electors. On social media, people were trying to be on the, on the far right to be alternate slates, but no state legislature had recognized any alternate slate. So it did not succeed. Not because of disorganization on the Trump side. In fact, they were quite organized. We document January 4th, Eastman and Pence in the Oval with Trump. Trump saying to Pence, listen to Eastman. Eastman's talking with Pence lawyers on the 5th. This didn't succeed as what many are calling a roadmap to a coup because there were no alternate slates of electors. But one of the reasons we end the book with the phrase peril remains is right now, Steve Bannon and others close to Trump are working at the municipal level to build a ground-up operation for 2022 and 2024 with the express purpose of making sure next time, if the count doesn't go their way, there will be organized alternate slates of electors. Wow. What would you say, there was, there was a lot that you revealed and a lot is come out, what would you consider the number one revelation in your book? The number one revelation, I, I, there's several. I mean, the, the number one revelation on the domestic front is the Eastman memo, because it, it memorialized in writing the actual plan, that this was not just a conversation on the phone between Trump and others, or an Oval Office meeting, this was a, a plan. The biggest revelation was that, and it's, Woodward always told me when we started, that the key with reporting is to discover what's going on, what he calls secret government. That so much of what happens now, and Woodward's been reporting on national security for decades, so much of what happens now is unnecessarily classified as top secret. And he said we've got to get beyond classification of top secret and realize what's going on. And again, another moment when we were stunned was when we realized that January 6th was an international crisis as well a national security emergency, for many reasons. One, there was a real belief that the president's mental health was off, that Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, believed that Trump was in serious mental decline, the nonpartisan senior officer of the U.S. military. You had Gina Haskell, the nonpartisan head of the CIA, articulate privately in November 2020 to many people. She worried that Trump was on the verge of a, quote, right-wing coup because he had fired the Secretary of Defense and was installing all of his people inside the Pentagon. And there was a meeting in November 2020 where President Trump seemed especially eager to hear attack options on Iran. And he really wanted to hear, how many times can we attack Iran this way and bomb it this way? And he had to be calmed down in, in the uh, national security meeting. You put on top of this the hair trigger environment in China, and that in terms of the biggest revelation, is probably the biggest revelation, that the Chinese monitor everything in U.S. politics. And U.S. intelligence showed four days before the election, on October 30th, 2020, that the Chinese believed that Trump was going to have a wag-the-dog attack on China. Now, Milley, Haspel, others knew this was not true, and we spell this out in our book. Milley did not believe Trump wanted war. Trump's a non-interventionist in the sense that he wants to get U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. Even though he uses militaristic language, he's not a traditional hawk. Milley knew it wasn't true just as, on his own conversations with Trump, based on our reporting. But China believed it. So Milley has to have a back-channel, top-secret, classified discussion with General Lee, the head of the People's Liberation Army. Now these kind of calls, as we document in the book, they're called mill-to-mill -mill calls, or can be routine. Milley was operating within his procedure, within his duty, to have another conversation 
This happened a lot during the Cold War, leaders of the US military talking to the Soviets to make sure things just stayed cool. In some of uh, the book, Republicans like President Trump have cherry-picked the quote of Milley saying to the Chinese, we're going to warn you. They don't read the full chapter. They don't read page 129 of the book. Milley's not being subversive based on our reporting. He's trying to de-escalate a situation. The Chinese are hot about what the U.S. might do. And so you couple the president's conduct and his unraveling collapse into his presidency with all of this happening on the Chinese side, it then leads to January 8th, two days after the insurrection, where he once again has to have a call with General Lee. And as you see right now with Taiwan, the Chinese are all over the South China Sea. And one moment that hasn't probably, it's a big revelation actually in the book, that hasn't got much attention, is that Milley, with uh, the Admiral over in the South China Sea at the time on January 8th, calls down the U.S. exercises. The U.S. was going to have major exercises on January 8th in the South China Sea. But the fear, and Milley privately called it the, quote, absolute darkest moment of theoretical possibility, was if the U.S. continued two days after an insurrection with exercises in the South China Sea where U.S. and Chinese ships often pass within yards of each other, that could trigger something, even if Trump didn't want war. Milley is an interesting, a, p a pivotal figure in the book. You open the book with him, and again, you, you reference him 128 to those who have the book. And there are other places where you see his influence and, and his voice, and, and really his worry, you know, about the, the mental stability of Trump after the election. Uh, Trump called, said he maybe should be uh, picked up for treason and other Republicans and call for his head. What, when, when someone like him of that stature is uh, in the book and talked about, do you then hear from him afterwards? Well, we heard from him with under oath testimony, which is, as a reporter, can be a little nerve wracking because you're sitting there going, okay, we have our reporting, we stand by it, it's solid. But this gentleman is under intense pressure. He's about to testify before lawmakers who are irritated on the Republican side to furious. What stood out about the testimony is that the testimony confirmed our book. Milley was careful in how he answered the question about whether he believed he could diagnose the president's mental health. He answered that by saying, he would, when he was pressed about our book, he said, I can't assess a president's mental health. But we have a transcript in the book. What a historical document. The Speaker of the House talking with the senior officer of the U.S. military about the president and about nuclear weapons. And to think that Milley felt compelled after speaking with Pelosi to call in the members of the National Military Command Center and say, whatever happens, you read me in. I'm part of the procedure. You got it? Yes, sir. You got it? Yes, sir. You got it? Yes, sir. Because we, this book has prompted a debate about the nuclear arsenal in this country. The Constitution says the President's Commander-in-Chief. And while there are procedures to launch nuclear weapons or any military strike, the law doesn't specify that those procedures must be followed. The law, there are procedures in the military, not a law that changes anything about who the Commander-in-Chief is. So technically, if the president wants to call a random colonel or admiral who's running the 24-7 nuclear center inside the Pentagon, technically the president could fire a nuclear weapon. And what Pelosi wanted, and our transcript shows this, is that she wanted assurances from Milley that knowing that reality that he would be involved. So you, you and Bob got together uh, and interviewed uh, Donald Trump in 2016 first got together and you did this book together and you've been covering certainly Republican politics and the Republican Party and you've been inside and, and understand the inner workings of, of uh, the party. In doing this book about Donald Trump, did you gain any new insights, anything that surprised you in the process of reporting the book? So many people around President Trump go in, and they privately have confided to this during the course of interviews and reporting, 
that they believe President Trump's like a child. A child they can control, manage, nudge in the right direction. But I can't tell you how many people I would sit down with, they would come over and sit at Woodward's Hall Methodist, you, you knock on their door, you have them over to your house, no phone calls if you can avoid it, in person. And how many people an hour or two into an interview would say, he's not a child, he's an adult. And he's an adult who knows what he's doing. And he's an adult who maybe four years ago, when he was elected president, was uncomfortable with power. But by the end, was fully comfortable with power and knew how to pull the levers of power to bend the presidency to his will. And they, there was a lack of understanding of Trump, even with those closest to him, that he was far more willing, even if he was inarticulate at times or seemed to be rambling or incoherent, he was far more determined and comfortable with the presidency and to use the presidency and to try to hold on to power than they realized that yes, as we document, a lot of people think he has narcissistic personality disorder. Paul, there's a chapter in our book about Paul Ryan, the House Speaker, believing he has that. And people have approached him through that prism. But by the end, there was really an understanding around him that this is someone they couldn't really control in any way. He was an adult in every way. Let me ask you a little bit about just the process of doing the book. I mean, Bob Woodward, of course, is, I don't know how many successive number one bestsellers. This is his 15. 15. And, uh, and thank you, we're now number two weeks straight number one at the New York Times bestseller. Congratulations. Thank you for buying the book. Uh, what, what, did, what was it like working with Bob on this? What was the, the process of, of writing with him? How did you divvy up the work? Can you tell people a little sure. about that process? I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had more fun, despite the bleak topic and the, the darkness that we would constantly report on. Working with Woodward's a joy. He is the most old school person I know, and I mean that in the best sense. I mean, it's, and it's amazing, he inspires me how much you can accomplish with just a reporter's notebook, a pen, and a recorder. And he would tell me little tricks about how to really do long form interviews. And we would read each other's transcripts. And Woodward's a, a real stickler for making sure you're reading what the work you do. And I, I was never, as a reporter at the Post for eight years, reading my reporting enough. You would do an interview. I would interview a senator like this in his office, and I would get the top lines in my notebook, and I'd go back and write the story, maybe listen to the tape once. Woodward said, you've got to interview someone for two to three hours, transcribe it, read it, highlight it, think about it, do a memo on further questions, then go back for another two or three hours. And what I learned is, his method's exactly right. Hope I'm not giving away too you much. Got, you Woodward. got tired. <laughs> but it, the, the easiest way to explain it, the way I kind of came to understand the method, is that if I asked you, maybe if anyone, I don't want to use you as an example, because I, you're the nice moderator, but if I asked you about your family, right, your sons, or if I asked you about your children or your siblings, you probably have a stock answer that you give people. How are your sons doing? How's your family doing? And you'll stick to that stock answer for 15 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours. But eventually, if I just stay there long enough and really keep coming back to the question of how do you really feel about your sister? <laughs> you'll say, well, three hours in, there was a time in third grade. Right. And you know, and then I'll, then once you say that, I'll say, okay. Do you have any emails or text messages or documents that could back up this episode? Well, we do have a file over here, and then you get into the real story. Yeah. And that's what Woodward's so brilliant at. As I said to Bob, I mean, it's, you don't have to be a genius. You just have to outwork everyone and think through what are we not doing. But Woodward, Woodward would always read my transcripts. And he would say to me, because he's so Midwestern, he's from Wheaton, Illinois, he would say to me, uh, this, was, this was good, this was good. Maybe uh, listen more. That sounds like Bob. I mean, my one story with Bob was, uh, in, we did our first book on Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, and the Brethren, which was a book that I read in college that Bob had done, and it was a 
fascinating look inside the Supreme Court for those who'd seen it. And, and, and so trying to get Bob's advice, and, and most of his advice was to go find the justices where they are. Like, you know, what I would do, Kevin, is David Souter lives on a house someplace in matches. I just go drive up there and knock on his door. <laughs> it was a very, very simple advice like that. John Paul Stevens lives down in Florida in a condo, spent the most of his time there. I would go down there and ring the bell. <laughs> and it was just a very simple, basic, and you know, and I thought, okay. Sometimes I'd be struggling. I, cause I'm 35, almost 36. I'm an email guy, phone guy. I would be struggling to get somebody to sit down with us. And then I would hear, Woodward just went to their house, knocked on the door. And some of these people who are very famous and have been around for a long time, when they got that knock at 8.17 on Tuesday night, Tuesday night's a good night to see people at their homes because they're often home on a Tuesday night. Uh, you're out on a Friday night, so if I was knocking on your door tonight, not the great night to knock on somebody's door. But you know what they say to Woodward when he knocks on the door, all the old school people in Washington, you're still doing this shit? <laughs> Right. Send a text message. So, speaking of Woodward, and and you you joined, uh, you know his his party, his cabal, your partners now. But part of uh, dialogue, verbatim, anecdotes, etc., are are a style of the best books. But it's something that he's certainly known for in his books. Um, Here's, here's one from, this is how you and Bob close chapter 25. It says, inside the Senate Republican cloakroom, one joke Majority Leader McConnell enjoyed telling was about Trump's former Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, Rex Tillerson a cabinet member he had liked. In 2017, the State Department... Wait, let me, let me do it. You do the joke. Go ahead. Let me do it. <laughs> you do it. I mean, I'm in Los Angeles. I could have another career here yeah. if this goes well. All right. All right. Uh, you, so this is the joke McConnell loves to tell in the cloakroom. Okay, the Senate Republican cloakroom is like the clubhouse. They eat candy bars and Diet Coke and whatever else, cigars. But I guess they have to smoke on the balcony. So McConnell who has a very dry sense of humor, will often tell this joke, we're told, based on our reporting. Uh, you remember why uh, Rex Tillerson, the former uh, Secretary of State, he uh, denied calling President Trump a moron? And the Republican senators will go, no, Mitch, why? Why was he able to deny it? Tell us, Mitch. Because he called him an effing moron. And he uses the real word, but we're at the Skirball Center. So I don't know, I said the S word. I'm not gonna go that far tonight. But that's McConnell's favorite joke. He despises Trump, despises. But he works with him. Transactional. He got Supreme Court justices. The number one thing based on our reporting McConnell wants is his legacy to be overhauling the federal judiciary. And even at the end of his Trump's presidency, a month later during the Senate trial, McConnell blames the insurrection on Trump, but does not vote to convict him. And that to McConnell in this book is such a prism for the Republican Party. He calls Trump a fading brand. He's from Kentucky. He says he's an off-the-track thoroughbred. He doesn't want him in the Republican Party, but he's willing to work with him even in 2022 because it's about power. People often ask Woodward and I, why, why does all this happen? And as someone who lives and breathes political reporting, I can't underscore enough power. They want it, they, they crave it on, in both, on both sides. And if it, working with Donald Trump is the way to get it, so be it. Was there, was there anything in, uh, that you wanted for this book that you didn't get in your reporting? I think there's almost too much in this book. I mean, we wrote a lot about President Biden that deserves attention. Uh, we have all these scenes about Senator Manchin and Biden screaming at Manchin, come on, Joe, it really gives a lot of insight into what's happening now. What did we not get? Here's what we did not get. 
There are two lingering questions for the House January 6th committee. And Woodward has often told me that Watergate happened because Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy were the operational commanders. That there was the discussion and the criminality inside the White House, but Hunt and Liddy drove it, the plumbers, to make sure that it happened at an operational level. Number one, what we don't know, and what we tried to get, but we did as much as we could in nine or ten months, but if I was writing a sequel, Peril 2, who were the operational commanders on January 6th? We've painted a picture in our book, a vivid picture, I hope, and it's led to two subpoenas of what happened between December 30th and January 5th at midnight. A lot that we didn't know, an intense coordinated pressure campaign. But on the day of, who were the operational commanders who take the rally from the ellipse down Pennsylvania Avenue and make the attack on the Capitol happen? It's originally framed in some of the reporting out there as organic, it kind of just happens. Nothing just happens. People make things happen. Who made it happen how? That's number one question that's still out there that I wish we'd answered. We're still going to try to answer as reporters. Number two, Trump's role. We painted a, a, a more clear, a clearer picture of Trump being directly involved, whether it was pressuring Pence on January 4th and 5th, using the Eastman memo, pressuring lawmakers on the night of January 5th. All these things are in the book. But what we don't know is what else. One of the reasons Steve Bannon, the reason Steve Bannon, based on the subpoena, got the subpoena is because we showed Bannon was in coordination with Trump December 30th and January 5th. This outsider, not someone on the inside. My lingering question now is who else? And so if I had, I've interviewed Trump, President Trump, probably 50 times in 10 years. I mean, here and there. Not all the interviews were hour long, but some of these were 10 minute things. But. Who, if I had one question to ask him, I wouldn't ask him anything about politics because he just keeps talking about the election being stolen in his view. If I could get one thing from him, it would be his phone logs. Because when I was at the Washington Post and you were there talking to Trump a lot, everything he does is on the phone. When he's doing television, we've all seen it, he does this whole thing. He's the persona of Trump. On the phone, especially even in a repertorial interview, He's a different, more candid person. And he, when I used to go visit him for the Post to do stories at Trump Tower, he had no computer on his desk. Everything was by the phone. If I had one question to ask him, I'd say, Mr. Trump, I would like to see your phone logs. Could you please share your phone logs from January 5th and January 6th? Why do you, why do you think he didn't, didn't talk to him a lot? And why do you think he didn't do interviews? Well, we welcome anyone to talk to us for this book, and I, we approached it in a professional way. Uh, we invited him to sit down for an interview. He declined. Uh, we don't want to start guessing about why he didn't do it. We know pub he was publicly angry about rage, Bob Woodward's previous book. Bob Woodward interviewed him at length, 10 hours, for that previous book. So he didn't participate in this, but we would have welcomed his input and his voice because he's a participant in the story. But if you look at almost every interview he gives now, he's one note. The election was stolen. The election was stolen. Lindsey Graham was quoted in your book saying that a third party movement would start if you tried to kick Trump out of the Republican Party. What, what do you think? Do, the Republican Party is in fully in full embrace with Trump. Trump, we have these scenes in the book of Trump getting briefed this summer, this fall, by his advisor saying you're never more popular than you are right now. You are so popular with the GOP base. The nomination is yours on the plat on a plate, and the presidency is yours on a plate. McConnell doesn't like Trump, but you don't see him trying to kick Trump out in a forceful way. Lindsey Graham knows we documented that everything the president was saying about election fraud was untrue, not backed up by any facts. We have a chapter that I think that's really important of Graham proving it on his own. It's not us saying it as reporters at the Washington Post. It's Lindsey Graham, a Trump ally. The Republican Party made a decision to, to stick with Trump, and it, 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 it's a decision as a reporter I traced back before even 2015. I think back to 2012 when I was covering the Republican Party, and on election night I was in Boston with Mitt Romney. And Romney and Ryan lost. 
I was with top Republicans in Boston, and they pulled me aside, there was a late dinner, and they said, Costa, our party's dead. We're never gonna win again, because we can't win over the working class. We're gonna lose Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, our party's dead. And they would think the Ryan's previouses of the world thought they had to move toward the center, uh, make overtures to Latino voters, but they didn't recognize that Trump was out there prepared to make a grievance argument racially driven on birtherism and other fronts, immigration, to the working class in all of these states. And a party at the elite level, the donor level, the leadership class, that thought it was never going to win the White House again, suddenly had a horse that was going to win the working class in the Midwest and elsewhere. And they said, if this is it, if this is the only horse in town, we're going to ride it. And they've been on that since 2015. And, and history will remember the Republican Party had ample opportunity throughout 2015 to say no to Trump. Every turn, Priebus, the head of the party, others just kept saying, we gotta work with him, work with him, let him be in. And in part, it's because they felt like there was no other, again, there was no other path to power but through Trump. What do you, what do you think, just stepping back, is the, the state of our politics and, and our, our divisions in the country, and where do you where do you think we are as a country as relates to politics and division? Well, I've had an opportunity as a reporter to, to step back for nine or ten months, and I would say this: when I started as a reporter, everything was couched in red versus blue, Republican and Democrat. That's not how our political system, at least when I'm up close to it as a reporter, talking to people in Congress, when they, these senators and congressmen sit down with you. It's not a, a red-blue fight anymore. It's at a deeper, more fundamental level of democracy. Do you believe in American democracy or not? Do you want to preserve it in certain ways or not? That's the debate at a fundamental level. Where is American democracy going? Not necessarily is the government spending too much money. And but when you ask where are we, you have a, pre a former president who has never conceded and who is actively out there on the campaign trail trying to change state parties and state governments to make sure he has a smoother path to power next time around. And a lot of times in the last few weeks, people have said to me, I'm so sick of Trump. I don't want to watch cable. I don't want to hear about this. They say we respect the book, but we're just tired. We're tired of this Trump. We've moved on. And all I would say as a reporter is, do not look away. Do not look away. Because this is happening in America. When we discovered the Eastman Memo, we realized this was what many people are calling a coup attempt. And you can say it was slap, slap dash and it wasn't done right, but it was organized to a point and you had the attorney, you had the Secretary of Defense fired in November. You had the Attorney General of the United States, Bill Barr, resign in December. And that's part of why Pelosi calls Millie on January 8th. She's saying, she's, she's no novice. She was on the House Intelligence Committee for years. She's deeply versed on intelligence and democratic stability. This is what she's done in Congress for 30 years. She's saying, we have all these people who are in acting positions. Who knows what's going to happen? And so where are we? It's, it's interesting now, on one level, to watch Senators Manchin and Sinema quarrel over $3.5 trillion, and there's all this fight about spending and the Democratic Party. But Trump's out there. He's in Iowa this weekend. And the Iowa Republican Party is pulling out the red carpet for him, twice impeached in an insurrection on his watch. And the Iowa Republican Party is going to have a major rally for Donald Trump. And if you watched his speeches, you probably haven't, you're Los Angeles people. <laughs> but we have. If you want to go to cspan.org, they're all there, 90 minutes long. And I studied Churchill at Cambridge, and he's stealing Churchill's language. We will never surrender. We will never give in. Do you suspect he will uh, run in 2024? I mean, I don't want to predict too much. I mean, every indication I have on his inner circle and who he's talking to privately is he's, he's running. It's not formally announced, but he's doing everything to run. 
And a lot of people who work for some of the rising stars in the Republican Party feel like they got the oxygen coming out every day. There are so many ambitious people in the Senate, governors around this country I've covered and gotten to know, and they feel suffocated with their own pol political careers. There's nowhere to go. And you look at the 10 people who voted to impeach House, the House Republicans, uh, who voted to impeach Trump in February of 2021, their careers just seem to be dying by the day. Because if you, it's now not about supporting Trump in the Republican Party. You must not just support President Trump to have political capital in many races and survive. You have to support that the election was stolen. You know, talk a little bit about our profession. You know, there, we certainly have had some tremendous reporting. I mean, you know, journalism has stood the test of time. You know, great investigative reporting. You know, revelations in your book throughout the, the Trump period and hey, administrations before Trump, there were great revelations and tremendous reporting. We have fact checkers, we have lots of documentation. Still there seems to be some gulf of belief in in journalism. And I wonder what you what your assessment of that is, what we can do better as a profession, um, you know, to, to bridge gaps. Um, just curious, as, as, as a reporter doing all of that great work, what more can you think we can do to uh, to make our work resonate? Well, one, you have to resist being politicized. And while this book and our reporting on the Post is very vigorous, and we're trying not to pull any punches and just put a mirror up to power, I sometimes I will go up meet, when I'm a political reporter at the Post full time, I'll go meet voters around the country stories from the post. And sometimes I'll, I'll approach someone who's more of the Republican ilk, and uh, I'll say, hey, Bob Costa with the Washington Post. And the first thing they'll say to me is, you're fake news. So the natural human response when someone goes, you're a jackass, or you're fake news, is, no, I'm not, to be defensive. But I've learned to not say that. Because the minute you start being defensive, you're not talking about your reporting, and you're, you're not focused on what your actual job is. So as a reporter, and I've told this to colleagues at the Post, whether it's President Trump calling us fake, and liars, or whatever he says, or on the left, sometimes people will say, hey, you're just corporate media, corporate media. To resist getting pulled into the riptide of this back and forth about who we are. I don't want to tell you who I am. The work itself should stand as reporting. That's it. Good so, advice. And not, just stand back and not, because the minute we become politicized and are seen as partisan actors, we, we're dead. We're dead. Let me ask you this just personally what did you learn about yourself in the process of doing this book? Well, I, I, I learned per, per, personally about myself that I need to do a better job. That you think one of the great things about doing this book, I was doing three jobs at once, hosting a show on PBS, MSNBC every day, post every day. And I really I had to do a better job reporting. And that stories like January 6th, it's not a drive-by story. It's a defining story of our times. And I had the luxury of time with this book with Woodward to really dig into it. But it's this whole experience is shaping me for my future because I can't now go back to typical political reporting because we're not in a typical political time. And I think personally, I've grown in the sense that I gotta really take this seriously every day and not just accept people's BS talking points, to not just kind of coast by, not that I was coasting, but we all can coast in whatever we're doing. If you're having success, and people are reading you. What Woodward taught me was that you're good, but you're not great, get great. You're great, man. I'm well, telling yeah. you. Um, we're going to open up the questions in a few. I just wanted to to point out to people that I noticed something in your 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 bio that your birthday is October 14th. It is. Which uh, is coming up. It's the same day as my son's. Oh, no uh, way. My youngest son. So. Oh, very cool. You and Sky Merida share a birthday. Very nice. What are you going to do? Uh, I'll be staying at Woodward's house. 
I think we have a Zoom event that day. We're doing a Simon and Schuster book festival. I, I think I, I saw that on the schedule. And so Woodward's house is so fun because it's, he's got a third floor, I hope I'm not giving too much away, but he's got a great third floor library. Sometimes we'll just go through all of his books and he has a story about every single book uh, and different presidents all these different experiences he's had. It's fun hanging out over there. So I'll, I, I'm, I'm positive on the night of the 14th. Yeah, I, I'm giving you an honest answer. We're working. And yeah, hopefully go on afterwards. Yeah, yeah, go on afterwards. Bob's COVID safe. He sends his best. But uh, I've been to Bob's house, and so I've, I've, I've seen the the regal place. He's done well. He's done well. Um, all right, we're gonna take some questions. I think there are microphones. People to line up the microphones if you can. There's a mic uh, there. In there. You know, I want to say something before that, that 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 I always feel like I have my my wife Donna Brent here. Who's a, Round of applause for Donna. Uh, a great writer in her own right. Yeah, a she was at the Post and a tremendous writer. But but I, I know just all of the things that I do and. Just being here and being able to be here is uh, a testament to, to what she gives me. And uh, the, the other person, I think, I think Gail Marshall's here. I, I hate to. She's not. Oh, she is there. Okay, there she is back there. And she works. With, she keeps me on point. You know, I, I I couldn't have taken a job at the LA Times. She's executive assistant. She, she, uh, I could have taken a job at the LA Times and, and been able to just start and learn everything without her help, and I appreciate it. So, uh, here we go. Question. Uh, first, thank you for making me feel old. My son will be 35 next week. Oh, wow. Well, uh, my, uh, my grandson. How a good October birthday is going on. And my grandson will be two on your birthday. Very good. Um, do you ever hear in the halls of Congress or anywhere else any talk about an attempt through the Justice Department and or Congress to invoke Section 3, Article 14 of the Constitution to attempt to uh, make a finding of insurrection on the part of Trump that would bar him from serving in 2024? Well, there was a real push during the Senate trial to have the Republicans buy into that argument to prevent him from running again. And on a constitutional level, the other thing we discovered in our book was the 25th Amendment was ignored. Uh, Pence is, it's a, it's a fascinating scene for history. If you haven't read the book, Speaker Pelosi talks to Chuck Schumer and she says, we gotta call Pence. This is the day after the insurrection. We gotta at least try the 25th. We don't know if he's gonna listen to us. We're gonna hope to have a good conversation. We gotta have a good conversation with Pence. So they get together, Pelosi and Schumer, call up on speakerphone, Pence. Pence doesn't take the call. Pence puts it on hold. Pence turns to his advisors, his lawyer Greg Sh uh, Jacob and his chief of staff Mark Short, and he says, what do we do here legally? What is the actual legal thing to do? We're being asked by the Speaker of the House and the head of the Senate Democrats to consider, and remember Chuck Schumer has just become majority leader after Georgia, to consider the 25th Amendment. And Greg Jacob, his Pence's counsel, a little known lawyer, but important in this moment, says to Pence, as a lawyer, sir, the president is not mentally or physically incapacitated based on our assessment. So this is not the time for the 25th Amendment. And while they're having this discussion about whether it's appropriate and they conclude it's not, Pelosi and Schumer are on the phone waiting for 20 minutes and ultimately, an aide gets on and tells them, Pence isn't coming to the phone. Thank you very much. So Pence ignored the 25th Amendment call, doesn't pursue the 25th Amendment. So Pelosi and Schumer look at each other. And they don't love it for a variety of reasons politically. They say, we're moving on impeachment. It's going to be a tight timeline, but if Pence isn't going to do anything, we're moving on impeachment. And Pelosi, as a speaker, is still up in arms, and that's when she calls General Milley on January 8th. Uh, I had a, com a comment and, and then a question. The comment is you talked about alternate uh, slates of electors. I saw on, I believe MSNBC, even CNN, there was an alternate slate of electors in a 
I'm not sure of the state, but I think... Hawaii, 1961? No, 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 no. Yeah, but in 2020. Um, I think it could have been Arizona. They presented themselves to the building where the boat conference right. was happening and said, we're the actual slave. Well, that is correct. So that's a very important question. She asked about a group of people presenting themselves as an alternate slate of electors. As we show in the book, Senator Mike Lee, others, they've recognized that just because someone, a group, if a group of 20 of you said right now we're alternate slates of electors from California, that doesn't mean you're an alternate slate. And so there are all these Trump allies during the transition period in different states, saying on Facebook and social media, and sometimes physically outside of the state legislatures, we are an alternate slate. But they were not recognized as alternate slates. So you can say whatever you want, but the, as I said earlier, the, the challenge for democracy is going to be is if a candidate loses in 2024, but has organized alternate slates to be recognized in various states, can the Constitution and our system withstand a coordinated effort to present alternate slates? And my question is a, kind of a follow-up to the gentleman right before me in terms of uh, legal situations with, with Trump. Do you think that uh, there are any legs to the income tax evasion cases in New York? Well, we're, I, I can't predict what the New York prosecutors are going to do. It's a TBD. The, the, what we have seen with Trump so far, and this is Vex prosecutors, and I've reported on this for the Post, is that the hardest thing with Trump, as I said, he does not use email. And to have to prove intent and criminality is very difficult. Remember the Michael Cohen episode. Michael, figure it out. Figure it out with Stormy Daniels. Figure it out. A conversation, not explicit, on intent, very hard to pin Trump down on was he was he actually directing campaign finance abuse? And this is the struggle, based on our own reporting, that many people find with investigating the Trump organization, but Trump himself. Do you have actual evidence of intent of criminality or criminality? And the taxes, of course, are always going to be something prosecutors will focus on. But I don't want to get ahead of what's going on in New York. It's still something that's working itself out. There's people over here, too. Kevin, over there, too. Oh, there's over there. Oh, uh, two questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, I used to work in aerospace and defense, and I've had security clearances. I know that I would never have gotten a clearance had I been indebted to, let's say, Russian oligarchs. Um, <clears throat> so the thing is that he obviously got his clearance because he's, uh, you know, he's president. But the, the, weakness, the weakness that I felt is that if in Trump Tower there's a, you know, if the people who bailed him out are Russian oligarchs, that would be an enormous, you know, I mean, it, it, that, would, that should be actionable in some sense. All right, but what's your question here? Uh, whatever happened to that, you know, that's the first question. The second question is much less... Well, Cy Vance and Letitia James in New York, they're looking into all these Trump finance issues. Congress has been trying to get better tax, Trump tax records for years. I mean, it's, we tried for four years at the Washington Post to do more, dig deeper on the president's finances. The New York Times did a terrific job, won a Pulitzer Prize for understanding, in particular, Trump's early financial status in the 70s and 80s when he really takes over control of the company from his father. So there's been tons of reporting. But in terms of your specifics about Russian money, the Post won Pulitzer Prizes for understanding Russian interference in the election. We're, we're always trying to figure out whether it's Trump or any other politician, what's the money driving any decision? How are these people supported? Uh, but that, again, is a, I know it's not a great answer, but TBD, if there is anything to what you're saying, New York may ferret it out. I mean, we have a limit as reporters. We don't have the subpoena power. Take another one from this side. And I can't see that apologize on those lining up the light. Seriously. Thank you both. Take it up. Um, I'd like you both to uh, respond to this. Um, the assault on truth and facts. And I think I heard in the soundbite world that two reporters got the Nobel Peace Prize. I think it was announced they did. today. So yeah. 
recommend them. The, I, one of the a Russian journalists, yeah. and I believe a journalist from the Philippines. Yeah, yeah I haven't, it hasn't been in print yet. <laughs> so I'll read it tomorrow. But what is your, what is your um, both of you, as, as executive of the LA Times, and, and of this assault on truth and facts? I mean, Patrick Moynihan, Moynihan famously said, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own set of facts. And that's, uh, you know, we was entered the lexicon alternate facts, which is obviously an oxymoron. So I just wonder, how can we, at a time when I carry my LA Times with me, and someone today called me a unicorn, because no one reads the paper anymore, bring this sound bite. So, you know, Brutia, how can we combat the assault on truth and facts, which is what, the fourth estate of democracy? So I just say both of your work is so important, and I, I thank you. Well, I, I've always been, I, I think transparency in, in doing events and communicating with, with, with readers and there's a lot, and, and, and to continue to do the report. You know, as, as Bob was saying, you, you, that has to be relentless and unshakable. And, but I also think there, there are a lot of groups that are, have um, nonprofits and others that focus on media literacy and to try to educate that, bring it into schools, to, to tell people in this age of, of the digital world where a lot of new platforms and, and misinformation and, deliver, and bots on social media and, and, and a lot of confusion to really help young people, starting young, to, to explain them and teach them uh, how to discern, you know, uh, facts from mistruths. And so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in the media literacy realm, but I think it's also, uh, we have to communicate more with readers and audience. We have to go to people and, and, and talk to them and explain to them and, and communicate and, and take questions. But, but mostly we have to keep doing the work. And, that, and the journalism does, you know, does stand the test of time. And the Los Angeles Times, for example, does such a terrific job of meeting readers where they are, which is often not as a reader, but as a viewer. You've all seen the Los Angeles Times television show, uh, which really connects people with where they are, watching TV, on a phone. And so, to your point about news literacy, I think there's even a deeper, more fundamental question about literacy. Who's reading now? I appreciate hundreds of thousands of people buying peril. But that's only hundred, a few hundred thousand people. This country is hundreds of millions of people. Who's reading? And beyond even the literacy question, are people reading enough? Can they process what they're reading? And on the process question, I think we, I encounter this as a reporter. We have a civic crisis in this country. How many people, it's not just about do you know who your senator is or your congressman. Do you have an appreciation for the gentleman over here with the question on the Constitution? Is the topic of civics being taught enough, understood enough? I, as a reporter, I would venture it is not. Because the thing that really alarms me in my work is how many, even in California, how many college graduates, college graduates, seem to have almost no grasp of U.S. civics. And these are good people a lot you encounter, and you're just like, what, where was the gap here? Yeah, no, you're right. Mm -hmm. This gentleman. Uh, super great question, first of all, uh, by that gentleman over there, because uh, I think media is under assault these days. Uh, I'm a journalist in Los Angeles, and my question uh, actually is to, to both of you, first of all, in terms of sourcing for the book, um, how would you uh, go about explaining the sourcing process and also, my second part of the question is, is totally unrelated. Is General Milley an American hero? So, to answer the sourcing question, we try not to be mysterious about this, even though it can, I guess, seem that way. In the back of the book, we have a note to readers, and it says the book is written on deep background. And what this means is, in brief, and we delineate this, is that if I'm sitting down with you and we're doing an interview on deep background, I'm going to record it and I'm going to use everything you say that I collect and confirm from 
from other sources. But I won't discuss attribution. I won't tell anyone that I learned it from you. But if I had a scene about what we discussed backstage, and you provided it, you may be in the scene, you may be outside, uh, you may not be mentioned, but we're gonna, if we confirm something, we're gonna use it. The whole purpose of this method, and I, I would prefer the whole book to be written on the record, but the reality is, if reporters are being candid with you, is that if you do something in this culture in Washington on the record, people clam up. And what we want, to your point about truth, is we want the truth. Ben Bradley used to tell Woodward, he would tell me all, this, all the time, our job is to get the most obtainable version of the truth. We won't always get as close as we want, but we need the most obtainable version. And deep background allows people, and it shouldn't maybe be this way, but this is the way it is, we live in reality, to have them really be candid about what people in power said, people they work for, maybe even at the moment, what actually happened. And then we say to them at the end of every interview, can you open up your Gmail for us right now? Can you show me your text messages? What about your diary? And sometimes people will say, not only do I have a diary, I have transcripts, tapes, notes. So we really want to get close to the truth. And in exchange, we protect their anonymity as sources. And I understand some people have quarrels with this. I, I, I respect the argument. But to get the kind of information we got here, a memo that shows the planning for a coup attempt, a national security emergency at the highest levels of the U.S. government, etc. Sometimes this is the method. And under your question about General Milley, it's for you to answer whether he was a hill hero or a villain. But our reporting shows, our reporting, that he operated within the bounds of his office to reaffirm procedures on nuclear weapons and to soothe the Chinese at two very tense times, two calls, October and January uh, within the past year, and that Milley was trying to de-escalate what he saw as a crisis moment for the country, and that Milley, we haven't discussed it yet, he had a turning point in his life on June 1st, 2020, when he arrives coincidentally in fatigues to the West Wing, and President Trump says, let's take a walk across Lafayette Square, and then Milley's photographed, and he turns to Esper, and he goes, you, you, I don't want to say the curse words here, my mother does not like how many F-words are in this book. But it's, it is the F-words are the truth. And he says, we're being used. And not only are we being used, but this guy's out of control. And this has also not got enough attention in the book. Trump wanted the 82nd Airborne, the most lethal group of the U.S. military, to come into the streets of Washington to clash with protesters over George Floyd's murder. And it came, this came close to happening. The 82nd doesn't just stay down in North Carolina. They're brought up to Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, just a few miles from downtown Washington. And they're waiting there in case they're called by the president to come into the streets. And if you know anything about the U.S. military, the 82nd doesn't, this is not the National Guard directing traffic around them, an event. They come to kill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Somebody on that side. Th thank you so much. I read an article in the LA Times or the New York Times that the Capitol had been recently renovated and that all the 600 paints of black, well most of them, had been replaced with bulletproof glass except for a small number of panes and some recessed floors and windows. That the group on January 6th may have relined to that area to this vulnerable, really vulnerable area. So I'm wondering what you think about that. And we mentioned earlier that you'd like to know more about who was in Right, the operational commanders. Right. So what is your plan? Do you think, what is, what's your plan? I don't like to say I think because that veers into speculation. I like to say some things I know. I, I don't know that there was a conspiracy on the windows. I've heard this. I believe it deserves further reporting, investigation. And I, I mean, I remember walking around the Capitol on the days after, and huge windows didn't have bars in them and were easily accessed on the first and second floor of the U.S. Capitol. And the, 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 I know the House January 6th Committee is still looking into what was actually going on within the ranks of the Capitol Police, within the ranks of the, the rioters, in terms of not paying attention to these entryways. I don't have a good answer for you in terms of the specifics, but these are all looming questions still about the 6th. Thank you. Hi. Great interview. Um, I have a couple questions. Regarding the state like, uh, electors, 
What can be done is the new voting rights, I think it's called the Freedom to Vote Act, will that help with that and other voting subversion issues or the Electrical Count Act? Like, where are those? Are those going to get done? What is your view about that? Well, our, our book has prompted all these editorials on the Electoral Account Act, how, how confusing it is. And the New York Times and others editorial boards are urging massive reform now to avoid this issue. Will it get done? Well, In your view. Well, one thing, I'll give, well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a, a real answer. Jim Clyburn, the House Majority Whip from South Carolina, he says in our book privately to others, Democracy is on fire. And why does he say that in the book? Because he sits with Joe Manchin in his office, the moderate from West Virginia. And he says Manchin to Manchin, Joe, the Republicans are going hog wild in the states on voting. We need you, Manchin, to break the filibuster so we can actually pass the voting legislation. And Manchin says, I don't want to break the filibuster. Joe, break the filibuster. We need to protect people. We need to protect this democracy. The Republicans are on the march. You know it, Joe. Help us. And Manchin won't break the filibuster. And law after law keeps getting passed in states that Democrats believe restricts voting. Republicans argue in places like Georgia it does not. You did note that. But people like Jim Clyburn say if the Senate Democrats don't break the filibuster in voting legislation, democracy will not only be on fire but lost. That's their view. Okay, when my friends want me to ask you, we're all activists, you know, women, we text, we write, we try to get um, candidates elected. What, what else can we do in this dire time? I would just say to my point about civics, if you're an activist, whether you're conservative or liberal, I can maybe guess where you land, but, uh, <laughs> real Rush Limbaugh listener here, but, uh, <laughs> talk to other people. I mean, the biggest problem that I encounter as a reporter is people are in their silos on social media. They're not reading the Post enough, they're not reading the LA Times enough to have a common set of facts. And so people say, well, what can I do in terms of an activist? Well, I'm not here to give you any activist advice, but are you talking to people in your community enough beyond social media, beyond doing a partisan thing? Because that's the thing that really is tragic to me when I go around as a reporter, is no one's talking to each other anymore. Uh -oh. but you're great too. Um, Thank you. And he didn't answer. Uh, he didn't answer one of his questions. Which? Uh, uh, well, who do you want to play yourself in the movie? Uh, <laughs> Bob Woodward told me that. Uh, uh, I don't know if I want to know the answer. <laughs> Bob Woodward said to me, uh, "I said, what's it like, Robert Redford? You're still friends with Redford. He played you in a movie." Woodward looked at me and goes, yeah, uh, I've disappointed a lot of women in my life. <laughs> so I would like to have someone, if it ever happens, not too good looking. Okay, first I want to thank Dan Quayle for saving our democracy. Okay. This Readers of Peril will, will understand. That's a great scene in the book, isn't it? Two Indiana Hoosier guys, Republicans. I mean, they're the only two people in the world that are Indiana conservative Republicans who have served as vice president in certified elections. What a weird thing to share with someone else. Sorry, I came to the room. Secondly, I think Trump is droopingly stupid and he's spreading massive stupidity. And we have a nation that's in dire peril because of it. How do we quarantine that orange Julius to, and get him out of the picture because he is massively dumbing down our society? <sighs> I, I, I'm not here to solve your life's problems here, okay? I'm a reporter. How do you get rid of Trump? First of all, if he seeks the presidency again, and you don't like him, work to beat him. I mean, I'm not here to say Trump should be eradicated or elected, it's not my job. But 
again, my point about not looking away, this guy's very serious. He's an adult. Everyone around him knows he's on the march to come back. And so this, this feeling that not there that, oh, he'll just disappear. Or why can't he go away? He's part of your system. He's here. He's not going away. And it may set you crazy some days. You may be really unhappy about it. But this, our, he's, this was a close election in the Electoral College. Biden won millions more popular vote, thanks to California. <laughs> but he's here, and he's not going away. Uh, now he may, he may choose not to run, but at the moment he's on the march, so I don't have an answer for you of how he dis disappears. He's not disappearing. All right, we, we, we're winding down here to make the final question. We have, what, two? Okay. Um, I read Bruckner's book as well. He sits next to me at the Washington Post. Why do these people talk to you? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's they're great reporters. Well, they they don't, even sources don't come into your house and go, "I'm here because you're a great reporter." <laughs> Some people have agendas, right? Let's be real here. Some people, but the most, the thing that's forgotten, and I see this up close as a reporter, is a lot of people actually want to make sure reporters know their perspective because. They know others are talking, and they know this is history, especially the time right now. And it's interesting how, how uh, sometimes I almost feel like a therapist, because people who are very proud publicly, sometimes even to this day, about their role, the shame they feel about th different things that happen. Why didn't they speak up? Why didn't they do more? Some did act. General Milley took steps in the transition to act. Many, many people did not. And I'll ask them, sometimes we'll have chicken salad sandwiches or pizza. I said to Woodward, can I give them beer? You can give them beer, he said. And I'll, say, I'll ask a lot of people two or three hours in, like I said, and say, why did you do it? Why didn't you say anything? And it's almost an emotional moment. You'll see some people start to almost cry. Because you realize, as much as you may hate some of these people, or love some of these people, they're people. And what happened? An insurrection, oftentimes under their watch, with their involvement? This is no joke. And a lot of them are grappling with that, still. And uh, so why do they talk? I can't read their minds, but they always have to talk sometimes. Because when you live in a world where your whole public life is spouting a line, it can feel very lonely. And it's almost, you can open up on deep background and say, let me tell you what really happened here. Okay, All right, just, uh, just quickly, when I was a young intern on Capitol Hill, there was three papers that we got the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the LA Times. Here, here. And I, I hope, with your influence on the Times, you can bring the Times back to be what it was 30 years ago, a, a paper of record in, in the United States. I, I, I wish you well in that. I know Kevin Meredith will do it. There's no one better. Thank you. Last question, and then Bob will uh, be back to sign um, books. First of all, thank you very much. You are a work. Speak up a little bit, I can hear you. Uh, I can talk closer to this, would that help? Oh, oh, no, got um, I just wanted to say thank you for tonight. But I, I just wanted to end on something, and I know you said you're not projecting, you're not, you know, saying, I think that we should do this. But you stated this is no longer about red and blue. It's not about Democrats and Republicans. It's about saving our democracy. And that, to me, is what we all have to figure out because we're all aware of what's happening. And it's happening very quickly. And so if there's anything you can leave us with in terms besides just talking to one another, 
it's crucial that we figure out how to save our democracy. And you sort of put that out there, and I'd just like you to end with giving us anything you have learned from your, you know, reporting, your interviews, to give us some sort of handle on how we can move forward, because we have to change this. I mean, just remember, you're in control of this country. It's very easy for people to feel like they're lost, right? If you're out here in California and Washington's so far away, all this insurrection's happening, the government feels like it's unraveling at times during the last year, a national security emergency unfolding behind the scenes. Recommit to civic participation. I mean, it goes beyond talking to people, but I know it's easy for And here's the other thing I would offer, and I'm not just trying to promote the Los Angeles Times. Why don't we have, why is the civic fabric unraveling? And I made the point earlier about literacy. I really mean that. It bothers me as a reporter, no one seems to read anymore. Whenever I talk to college students, I'll say this. They'll ask me a similar question, what do I do, what do I do? And I'll say, read a paper a day. And I'll say, can you read a print newspaper? Uh, uh, maybe you, you don't like the print newspaper, but I'll say, read the print newspaper. And they'll say, well, I read it on my phone. I read the apps. I said, that, uh, oh, that's nice. But can you spend the amount of a cup of coffee on a print newspaper? Because people aren't reading, and if they're reading, they're reading usually social media curated news for what they want. The joy of a newspaper, print, is that you're forced to read about the arts, sports, global news, economic news, business news, political news, all at the same time and having a full spectrum of what's happening in this country. And that, when I was growing up and my grandparents were around, they would sit there and read the whole paper. Who does that anymore? Very few. Some of us do. Some of you do, thank God. Yeah, very good. I well, know, well, so read a paper and encourage young people to read a full paper. Yeah, young generation. The younger generation does not read. Because if, if, you, well, if you're only in a curated stream of what you want to read, you'll never be challenged, you'll never have a bigger perspective. So I hope I've kicked you all in the ass to go tell people to read. Hey, let's uh, give a round of applause to Bob Costa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Skirball, and the writer's block. Appreciate it. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.